particularly pointed study about particularly what worship is and how worship is demonstrated. And Psalm 29, verses 1 and 2, the scripture says, Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. It is our responsibility and also our privilege as the people of God to be worshipers of God. And yet there's, as I mentioned on Sunday night, a lot of confusion about what worship is and what is involved in worship, what makes up worship. Uh, some people are looking for a particular kind of atmosphere. Uh, some people are looking for a particular kind of sound or a particular kind of emotion. And so we took some time on Sunday night to speak a little bit about what worship is. And we're trying to answer the question, since we desire to be worshipers of God, are we accomplishing what we intend to do? Are we worshiping God in the way that he has told us he wants to be worshiped? And so just by way of review, we spoke on Sunday night about some definitions of the word worship. And we mentioned that in the English language, the word worship particularly means to honor or to revere a supernatural being or power. We also said that along with that honoring and revering, that there is a part of the definition which has to, to do with bowing down to God or bowing down to the one who is worshiped. Then, if you recall, we spoke about the primary Hebrew word, which is translated worship in our English Bible, and that particular word is translated with the, the English word worship in our Old Testament 99 times. And that particular word uh, means uh, exactly and actually literally to bow down, to crouch, to fall down, to humbly beseech, to do obeisance, to do reverence, to make, to stoop. And then we talked about the Greek word in our English New Testament which is translated with the English word worship about 60 times. This is the most common Greek word from which our English word worship appears in our New Testament. And that particular word is also having the meaning of like a dog licking his master's hand. It means to fawn or to crouch down before, literally or figuratively. It means to prostrate oneself in homage to do reverence to and to adore. And so as we thought about those definitions then, we spent some time looking from the scriptures about the person who is to be worshiped. And of course, I believe we came away with the clear conclusion that God and God alone is worthy of worship. And we ought to reserve our worship for God. While we can respect other human beings, uh, we should not come close to approaching the level of worship that we give to God because indeed he is worthy of our worship and our praise. And we looked at some scriptural reasons about why God is worthy of our praise. And we also mentioned in the book of Exodus chapter 34 that our God is a jealous God and the scriptures go so far as to say that his name is jealous. That is that our God is very particular about who receives worship, and he expects that he would be the only one whom we would worship. Then we talked about the priority of worship, and we mentioned to you from the scriptures about how it is man's highest obligation and privilege to worship God. We are actually created by God for the purpose of worship. Do you know this tonight, that when we get in the presence of the Lord in heaven, we're going to spend all of eternity worshiping. And some people think, boy, that sounds really boring. Well, uh, if you think that sounds boring, that's because you don't understand what worship is or you're not a child of God, one of those two things. And uh, th the reality is that we will uh, reach our highest zenith of fulfillment and of satisfaction when we are in heaven and worshiping God without the constraints of a sinful flesh. And think about what that will be like to be able to worship God without uh, any sinful thoughts coming through your mind, without any distractions, 
uh, without in, in any way being pulled away from your purpose and being able to worship God with a pure heart and fervently. We said that worship ought to be a priority for us because God is our creator. And as our creator, our God is very worthy of our worship and our praise. He's the designer. He's the one who made everything that is, and we owe him our worship. But not only because he is the creator, but we said second of all, because he is our redeemer. For those of us who are saved, we have been redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And we ought to be so very grateful and thankful for what God has done for us And of course, one of the primary reasons that God has saved us is so that we would worship and praise Him. Now, we want to talk a little bit tonight about the practice of worship. And we're going to look at a number of verses which speak about different ways that we are able to worship God. And we want to start in Psalm 66. We're not too far away from there. And so I want to invite you to turn to Psalm 66. And the the first way that we can worship God, uh, actually, we just got done practicing this one in Psalm 66 and verse number four. The Bible says, all the earth shall worship thee and shall sing unto thee. They shall sing to thy name, Selah. Isn't it an incredible ability that God has given to us to be able to sing? And I know some of you think, well, God didn't give me that ability. But uh, the truth is that all of us have at least, uh, and there are varying degrees of this, but all of us have at least some ability to make musical tones with our voice. And what a privilege it is to be able to use those musical tones to worship and to praise God. Now, uh, you know, there are other Uh, functions of music, and there are other things that music can accomplish. But I believe one of the primary reasons that God made music is so that we could use music as a vehicle to praise God. When you think about the music that the world offers, you'll notice that the world's music often is worshiping the world's gods. It's worshiping... um, physical relationships with other people. It's worshiping uh, material goods. It's worshiping the feelings that come through different substances. And it's singing about these things. And uh, often it's speaking about the heartaches and the difficulties that people are struggling with and how they decided to cope with those things. But you know, as the people of God, we ought to experience this, that God has given us a new song in our, in our heart and in our mouth. Uh, we have the opportunity to sing praise to God. Let me show you some other verses in Psalm 28. Flip back there. You'll not be surprised that all the verses that we're going to look at come from the book of Psalms. Psalm 28, in verse number 7, the Bible says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in Him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoiceth, and with my song will I praise him. Song is a unique way to praise the Lord. In fact, we find that music has a great deal to do with our emotions, and our emotions can be deeply affected by the music that we choose to listen to, and even more by the music that we choose to sing. Can I encourage you in your car and in your home, and in the places where you're able to choose the music that will be uh, playing for folks to hear, that you choose good, godly music that speaks about praise to God, and that uh, gives you thoughts about who God is, and directs your thoughts to the scriptures and the truth of God. Please don't fill your home with the worldly tunes and thoughts that will cause your heart to stray from the Lord, and uh, will draw you away from Him. Uh, we have the opportunity to worship God with our song. And, and we don't just do that here in the assembly, although we certainly ought to do that in the assembly. Uh, we can do that in our homes and in our cars and uh, even in our workplaces and, and the different places where God allows us to sing. Did you ever see somebody bebopping down the road, driving and obviously enjoying some music that was going on in their car? 
Uh, why is it that God's people wouldn't want to do the same thing? And you say, my voice isn't so good and I wouldn't want anybody to hear me. Well, when you're alone in your car, sing to the Lord. At, at least you can sing there and not worry about what anybody thinks. You, you'll have to roll the windows up, though, and keep the air conditioning on. Psalm 69, turn over there, if you would. Psalm 69, verse number 30. The Bible says, I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. I think uh, there's a particular kind of song that the psalmist has in mind here. And we know there are different kinds of songs that we sing in our assembly. We sing songs about testimony and songs about the hope that we have in the Lord. But there are also songs that we sing which are centered around the character and person and names of the Lord. And those are important songs for us to sing. Those are important songs for us to lift up to the Lord. In fact, the book of Psalms is the scriptural songbook. And we don't have the tunes to these songs, but we have the words. And we have the opportunity to sing some things to the Lord. How about Psalm 149? Psalm 149 if you study the book of Psalms, you'll find that it is replete with the names of God and speaks often about the character of God. Of course, it speaks about the psalmist's experience and relates the psalmist's experience to the unchangeable characteristics of our great God. Psalm 149 and verse number one says, Praise ye the Lord, sing unto the Lord a new song and his praise in the congregation of saints. You know, when we assemble together as believers, and this, of course, is speaking about in the tabernacle and later in the temple, but uh, when we assemble together here in the church, we have the opportunity to lift up our voice and to sing praise unto God, to sing praise in the congregation of the saints. Isn't it a wonderful thing to be in an assembly where everyone else is singing and everyone is lifting their voice to the Lord, and we're singing together and worshiping God. It's a wonderful opportunity to encourage one another in song. One of the things I appreciate about our church so much is how so many of you sing out, and you sing with enthusiasm, and you enjoy the song time. And a lot of thought and preparation goes into our song service, and you might have noticed that oftentimes on Sunday mornings in particular, we are singing songs of worship to God. We are singing songs which center around the person of God or the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are uh, lifting our voices in praise to God. This is one of the reasons that we often focus on Sunday morning as our worship service. We often call it our Sunday morning worship service where we may not uh, put so much emphasis on that in Sunday evening service or Wednesday evening. We might as well. But definitely on Sunday morning, we're going to really lift our voices and sing praise to God. Maybe you've never noticed that before, and you'll take notice of that in the future. And uh, as you think about those songs on Sunday mornings especially, I hope that you really lift up your voice and sing to the Lord. A and not sing to your neighbor and not sing for anybody else's benefit, but really come to sing to the Lord. I think one of the reasons that we like to sing out of the hymnal and sing familiar songs, and there are several reasons for it. Uh, one of the reasons we sing out of the hymnal is because the songs that are in our hymnal, for the most part, are very uh, carefully written, sound doctrinal songs which speak about the character and person of God in many cases. And we want to be careful that the songs that we sing are not just repeating some kind of a mindless mantra, but that they are really deep and that they are speaking about who God is and our relationship with Him. A, a reason that we try to sing familiar songs and why, for instance, we don't say on Sunday morning, we're going to introduce four new songs for the congregation to learn is because we want everyone to be able to sing. And of course, we occasionally we'll learn new songs and that's an, an enjoyable experience but for the most part we want to sing songs that are familiar to us now one of the the pitfalls of singing familiar songs have you noticed what it is did any of you do it tonight you you can sing the songs because you know the words so well without even thinking about them and so sometimes you have to check your mind and say now wait what did that verse say 
Was I thinking about what I was singing uh, as, I, as I'm singing this song of worship? Am I really from my heart praising God? Because remember, we need to be praising God and worshiping Him from the heart. It's not just something that we do mindlessly, but it's something that we ought to do with a real focus and real intention. Can I encourage you in our song service not to count that as a minor part of the service? Sometimes we think, well, it's the song service, you know, I'll hang out in the foyer and talk to my friends. I'll come in 15 minutes late, and as long as I'm there for the preaching, that's good enough. Well, you're really missing an important part of the service when you miss the song service, because the song service goes a long ways towards preparing our hearts for the preaching, but it's also a part of the service which is important because it's intended to worship God. And we ought to, uh, and the Bible speaks so many times about singing and how important our songs are to the Lord. You know, there's a second way that we worship God, though, and that is by giving to the Lord. Turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 26. Not only do we sing, but we also give. Deuteronomy chapter 26 And look with me at verse number 10. The Bible here is speaking about in the future as the children of Israel are coming into the presence of the Lord. And in verse 10 he says, And now, behold, I have brought the first fruits of the land, which thou, O Lord, hast given me, and thou shalt set it before the Lord thy God, and worship before the Lord thy God. Do you know that the giving of the first fruits for the nation of Israel was intended to be an act of worship? And it was a little different for them than it is for us in that they were an agricultural society. And as a farmer uh, would bring in his harvest, he would take the first part of that harvest, which was often the best part of the harvest, and he would gather it together and he would bring it into the tabernacle or later the temple And he would set it there before the Lord and he would offer it. Now we know that then uh, those first fruits were often what was used to feed the Levitical families, those who worked around the things of the Lord. But can you imagine a farmer bringing the very best and the very first part of his harvest and setting it before the Lord? And you'll take note in the text that he says that they were to set it there and they were to worship the Lord. Let me encourage you that when you give your tithes and your offerings, that you regard that as an act of worship of the Lord, not just as something that you do. And of course, we live in a unique time. I want you to turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 16. We live in a unique time in that much of our transactions are digital and the whole idea of exchanging cash for things is, is quickly passing away and out of style. And I'm not opposed, and you know that we have the ability here for uh, you to be able to give your tithes and your offerings digitally through your computer or your smartphone. But I do want to say this, that you ought to be careful when you're giving to make sure that you're thoughtful about that. And maybe you want to, during the time that we're receiving the offering, really think about and worship the Lord and, and appreciate Him for all that He's done. And think about what you're giving Uh, Maybe you're not giving it at that very moment. Maybe you gave it earlier in the week, or maybe you're going to give it at another service. But use that time to really praise God and worship Him because He is worthy of our worship. How about 1 Chronicles 16 and verse 29, where the Bible says, Give unto the Lord the glory due unto His name. Bring an offering and come before Him. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. So bringing an offering is equated with worship. And uh, they were expected in that economy to come before the Lord with an offering that they were going to give to Him, with something that they were going to praise the Lord with and and honor Him. And uh, certainly uh, there are those today who believe, well, you know, the tithes and the offerings, that was Old Testament. God doesn't expect us to give anymore. I, I 
don't agree with that. I think if you look in the scriptures, you'll find the tithes and the offerings and the attitude of a giver all through the Bible in the New Testament as well. I would say this, that we ought to uh, try to give to the Lord as much as we can to worship Him and to praise Him. And I've, again, I appreciate being a part of a church that, that has a giving heart. Uh, I, it's a blessing to be a part of a church where I don't have to get up and plead with the congregation to give so that we can pay the bills. You all uh, follow the leading of the Lord and God provides for our needs. And, uh, and I appreciate that. You know, we ought to have that kind of an attitude, though, that when the offering comes, we, we ought not to be begrudging God. And sometimes when you're writing your tithe check or you're, you're getting ready to put that in the offering plate, maybe there's part of you that says, boy, what could I do with this? Uh, what else could I do with this? And, you know, you ought to think, how can I praise God with this? How can I worship the Lord? And, and certainly, I'll, I'll tell you this, as, as a preacher, sometimes I have that thought. What can I do with this? And then I have to say, Lord, forgive me. You deserve so much more than what I'm giving even now. And you're deserving of my worship and my praise. So we can worship God by singing and we can worship God by giving. We do those things, don't we? Here at our church, we sing and we give. A third way that we can worship God is by serving Him. And I want you to go to Psalm 100. Psalm 100. And look with me at verses 1 and 2. Now this... These verses reference singing, which we spoke about a few minutes ago. But notice also there, it says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. And so part of worship is the service that we give to the Lord. We have an opportunity in our life to serve God. How do we serve God? Well, we can serve Him by being obedient to Him, uh, by doing the things that He has commanded us to do. We're going to look at some verses which deal with that in just a moment. Uh, we have opportunities to serve the Lord by serving others because, you know, God is invisible, but He asks us to love one another. And one of the primary ways that we show love to God is by loving one another, by loving our neighbor, as Jesus spoke about there in the book of Mark. And so we know that we ought to serve the Lord with gladness. Can I encourage you that in your service for the Lord, you do that with gladness? And I know sometimes it's hard. Um, some of you will serve the Lord by serving down in our children's classes, our nursery and our children's church. And uh, you'll be down there for a couple of weeks. And, and maybe sometimes you'll be thinking, oh, I don't want to be down here. I, don't, I want to be doing something different. This is, this is uh, such a drudgery. Well, you, you ought to think, I'm not down here just for these kids. I'm here to serve the Lord. I'm here to honor the Lord with my presence. Serve the Lord with gladness. So, some of you are ushers, and there's different responsibilities that our ushers fulfill. And uh, as an usher, you ought to serve the Lord with gladness. Uh, even if you get stuck in the parking lot and it's snowing, you can still serve the Lord with gladness. Uh, what a privilege it is to serve the Lord. Uh, what, a, what an opportunity it is to serve the Lord in different areas of ministry. Uh, some of our folks serve the Lord by going to nursing homes and uh, in the area here, and they preach the Word of God, and they uh, sing songs and try to encourage those residents and speak to them about the things of the Lord. And, and sometimes that's a thankless ministry, isn't it? Sometimes that's a difficult ministry, but uh, you ought to do that. If you're doing that, you ought to do so by serving the Lord with gladness and make sure that He is the focus of your service. How about in 1 Samuel chapter 12? Would you turn there with me? 1 Samuel chapter 12 is very interesting. Verse number 24 The Bible here says, Only fear the Lord and serve Him in truth with all your heart. For consider how great things He hath done for you. Why is it that we would serve the Lord? 
Well, the reason we ought to serve the Lord is because we've considered what great things He's done for us. And because we want to, uh, if, it, if it could be, now we know we can't ever pay Him back, but we want to show Him appreciation for all that He's done. We want to serve Him in such a way. And, and He says there, serve Him in truth with all your heart. Make sure that your service to the Lord is not begrudging. Make sure that it's not something that you're just that you're just going through the motions. Now, we've seen that as a theme, haven't we? When we sing, we ought to sing with all of our heart, and we ought to praise God, not begrudgingly. We ought to do so with thought. When we give, we ought to give wholeheartedly. We ought to be cheerful givers, and we ought to have the right attitude. When we serve, we ought to serve the Lord with all of our heart. Let me show you some other verses. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 5. Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse number 29. Deuteronomy 5 and 29. And of course, Deuteronomy is the second giving of the law to the nation of Israel, to that second generation that was raised up in the wilderness just before they went in at Kadesh Barnea. And in verse 29, God is expressing His desire for the children of Israel. And He says, Oh, that there were such an heart in them that they would fear Me and keep all My commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Do you see that? God's desire was that they would have a heart to serve Him, a heart to obey Him. And, and when we are disobeying God, when we are not serving God, it is primarily a heart issue. It's not a mechanical issue. It's not a do this and not that issue. It is where is your heart? Is your heart in tune with the Lord? When your heart's in the right place then you'll be obeying God. Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse number 15, If ye love me, keep my commandments. One of the ways that we show our love to God is by being obedient to the Lord. And I want to suggest to you that we serve the Lord in that way. When we are being faithful to the Word of God and we are obeying the Lord, then this is our opportunity to serve God. The Lord. I think if you are being uh, faithful to the commandments of the Lord in your home and you're trying to honor God uh, in the roles that you have in your home uh, as the husband and the wife and the father and the mother and the children and you're trying to order your home after the ways of the Lord, I think that's serving the Lord. And if you're doing that from your heart, that's an act of worship to God. That's an opportunity for you to show God that you uh, love Him and that you want to be obedient to Him. In fact, much of what we do in the house of the Lord, if you'll notice, is instruction from the Scriptures about how to serve the Lord. What are the things that we need to avoid so that we will, will, will not be, or, or so that we will not not be serving the Lord. That's a double negative, and now I can't even think of how to say that the right way. Do you all understand what I'm saying? So that we will be serving the Lord, and, and that we won't be avoiding serving the Lord. And, and then there's also a lot of positive instruction that takes place from the pulpit and in our classrooms about, okay, how should you live for the Lord? And here's what you should do, and here's what you shouldn't do. And, and the authority is not uh, what I say, but the authority is what does God say? And then as we go out of here and we take this and we're going to serve the Lord. Some of you uh, recently have been challenged about sharing the gospel. And when we share the gospel, we're serving the Lord. We're, we're taking the gospel to people who need it. We're, we're going in obedience to the Lord. And that is an act of worship. And I suggest to you that as a church, we spend time singing in worship of God. We spend time giving to worship God. And we encourage you to serve and to obey God so that you can be worshiping the Lord. And I want to just challenge you tonight, if you're a member of this church and you're not serving in some areas of ministry, you might want to consider what the Lord wants you to do and how the Lord wants you to be involved. Uh, what, how would the Lord want you to be contributing to the, to the work of the ministry? And, and we should all be a part of something and uh, be a part of serving the Lord and obeying Him. But then fourth of all, I believe we can demonstrate from the Scriptures that we worship God practically by our living. 
And this is really a continuation of what I introduced to you third of all there about serving God and obeying Him. And I want you to turn to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. I think this is one of the most remarkable truths in the, in the New Testament to me is that we have the opportunity to serve God even with what we would consider to be the mundane parts of life. Colossians chapter 3, look with me at verses 22 through 24. The Bible there says, Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Now you'll note in verse 22, he's addressing people who are servants. These were bond slaves, people who had gotten themselves uh, through bad circumstances or perhaps through poor decisions, had gotten themselves in financial distress and as such had to go and give themselves over as bond servants. Perhaps this uh, master was going to pay their debt and they were going to work a certain amount of time for that master in exchange for their debt being paid. And you might perhaps think about that as a little bit of a stinky situation as perhaps a servant might not have the greatest attitude towards his master and might begrudge the, the better welfare that his master has that he doesn't enjoy. And yet here, the Apostle Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is speaking to servants who are believers. And he says, in your work, in the type of menial labor that you do for your master, make sure that you are doing it to the Lord. Make sure that you are serving the Lord and, and make sure in that service that you're not doing it with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. You all know what eye service is, don't you? When the boss is looking, you work extra hard. And, and when you know the boss is out to lunch or off at some appointment or out of town, then you kind of slough around and don't get too much done. And whenever the boss shows up, oh, everybody looks busy. And, and that's eye service. But Paul says this, listen, if you're a believer, you're not serving your earthly master. You're serving the Lord. You ought to make sure that what you do in your employment is focused upon the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but perhaps some of the things that you do at your job, you find to be of, of little value. Maybe you even think, why am I doing this? And, and in your mind, you're thinking, the only reason I'm doing this is to bring a paycheck home so that I can pay the bills. And if I didn't have bills, then I wouldn't be doing this, that's for sure. My son said to me the other day, we were going somewhere, and we talk sometimes, Isaac and I, about occupations and different jobs that would be interesting. And he said to me, Papa, I think one job that I wouldn't be too interested in is the trash man. I said, you know, I, I don't disagree with you there. I'm not sure that I'd want to go around picking up other people's garbage. But you know what? If you're a trash man, if that's what you do, do it to the Lord. Do it to please the Lord. Do it to honor Him. If you're a carpenter, do the best work that you can as if the Lord himself is going to inspect the job. If, you're, if you work on a computer, make sure that whatever you do, the keys that you punch, the code that you put in, that it's all for the Lord, and you'll, you won't be sorry about the fact that you are living your life for the glory of the Lord. Isn't it remarkable that we can do something as seemingly meaningless as our jobs, and yet we can do that unto the Lord, and we can worship the Lord on a daily basis. How about this? 1 Corinthians chapter 10. In case that wasn't enough, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 I find to be a fascinating passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 31. He says this, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Whatever you're doing, do it to the glory of God. You know you can mow your grass to the glory of God. 
You can clean your house to the glory of God. Some of you who are homeschoolers can teach your children to the glory of God. Uh, some of you who have uh, hobbies and you say, well, it's just a hobby, you could do that to the glory of God. Uh, there is not a single thing that is godly and right that we can't do to the glory of God. Now, if you can't do it to the glory of God, then you should probably ask whether you should be doing it. You know what I'm saying. So whatever you're doing, make sure that you're doing that to the glory of God. Because in our life, our life is an expression of worship. And here's one major problem that we have is we tend to equate worship with, okay, I go to church and I worship God there. Well, I hope you come to the assembly and that we worship God together but you know, God is interested in every part of our life being an act of worship towards Him. This would help us a lot in our daily life to live with purpose and to live with purity and to live by principles if we understand that everything we do is intended to be worshiping God. Everything that I engage in, everything that I'm a part of, I ought to be worshiping God. I'll suggest to you that this will cut down on a lot of your entertainment because a whole lot of that entertainment is going to be hard to justify that as something that is worshiping God or praising God. Now, I'm not saying that entertainment in and of itself is wrong. I'm just saying that once you put it through that filter, that's going to put a lot of things out of bounds and say, well, it's hard to justify that as glorifying to God. Are you all following what I'm saying? So in my life, I want to be careful. Yes, I want to be a worshiper of God, but I'm not just going to worship God on Sunday. I want to make sure that I'm worshiping God every day of my life. We have some books uh, that we read aloud to our kids a couple of years ago, and we really enjoyed them. Um, the, the one title which I remember, is Created for Work. And the author of that series of books, he wrote about, I think, four books, which we read aloud. The author of that series of books was a believer. He's, he's with the Lord now. He died of cancer a couple of years ago. But uh, he was a believer, and he was a carpenter. And the reason we like his book so much is because he talks about real life and what he did as a carpenter and building things and lessons that he learned and how he learned to be a worshiper of God with every part of his life. And uh, we, we really enjoyed reading them. And it was a great reminder that no matter what you're doing, you can worship God. You can praise him. So we ought to worship God with our singing, and I think we do that. We ought to worship God with our giving. We ought to worship God with our serving and obeying of him. We ought to worship God with our life. Can I suggest the fifth way that the scriptures speak about worshiping God? Let's turn to Psalm 95. Psalm 95. This is the last one we're going to talk about tonight. And this is one that has got my curiosity up a little bit. Psalm 95, verses 6 and 7. The Bible says this. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. Today, if ye will hear His voice, harden not your heart as in the provocation and as in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Now verse 6 says, Specifically, O come, let us worship and bow down. A fifth way that we worship God is by the literal physical act of bowing before Him. Bowing before God. Now, I realize that this is primarily and first of all a heart condition. And that it is not necessary for a person to get on their knees or on their face before God in order to be bowing before God in their heart. We ought to start with a heart of humility, and yet it is impossible to escape the clear language of Scripture, which repeatedly emphasizes the fact that to worship God is to bow down before God. Psalm 132. Psalm 132. Are you all still with me? Yes. 
Okay. Don't worry, pastor's not going off the deep end here. But I'm really, really fascinated by this word worship and what it actually means and how the Bible describes it. Psalm 132 and verse number 7 says this, We will go into his tabernacles. We will worship at his footstool. Now, it doesn't explicitly use the word bow, although I will point out to you that the word worship there does literally mean bow. But it, it says at his footstool. And a footstool is, if you were sitting in a chair and resting your feet on something, obviously something that is down low. And so it, it seems to indicate that at least in the hearts of these worshipers, they were coming and they were bowing down in their heart before the Lord. How about 1 Corinthians chapter 14? You say, that's Old Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. The context of 1 Corinthians 14 is about the use of the sign gifts, the use of the gift of tongues in particular, and some rules about that and, and what is preferable to the gift of tongues, which we dealt with that in a previous message. And of course, we don't believe that the gift of tongues is still uh, in, in effect today. But in verse 25, when someone prophesies in the assembly and this unbeliever is there, 1 Corinthians 14, 25 says, And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. And so, falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. And so it equates in 1 Corinthians 14, 25, when we worship God, we fall on our face before God and we worship Him. Now, let's talk about this for a moment. And I spent a, a lot more time on Sunday evening talking about the definitions of these words and, and what they meant. But let's talk about a couple of things. First of all, let's, let's establish this thought that whenever we come to worship God, we ought to make sure that we are coming with a humble and contrite heart. Would you agree with that? God resisteth the proud and giveth grace unto the humble. We ought to make sure that in our worship, we're not trying to look around and see what somebody else is doing and elevating ourselves over some other person. But really, when we come to worship God, we ought to be here encouraging one another, but also really focusing upon who God is and focusing upon this fact, who am I? Lord, I'm, I'm a nobody. I don't deserve to be in your presence. We ought to have that attitude of humility. And certainly, uh, I believe that people could be involved in bowing down, and yet on the inside, they're standing up. You see what I'm saying? So they might adopt the physical position, and there are a number of uh, religions which emphasize bowing, but emphasize bowing to the wrong God, or emphasize bowing without really emphasizing the truth of having a contrite spirit, of having a humble heart. And, uh, you know, we're, we're certainly not going to ask people to start genuflecting in our church. And some of you were saved out of that sort of a background. And, and you think, boy, you know, I've seen a lot of people who go through the motions of bowing down. And if you've ever been in a service of a church like that, that's liturgical, the up and down and, and uh, down on your knees and back up again. And, and it all gets very mechanical and empty and, and it's meaningless to most of the people who are there. And so we're not suggesting that the physical act of bowing itself is significant apart from a heart attitude. We ought to have the right attitude of humility and of worship to God. In fact, we need to know this, that when we worship God, we should worship Him in spirit and in truth. And we'll look at that verse in just a moment. However, I do want to point out to you that scripturally, it is inescapable for us to come to any other conclusion than that primarily in the Bible people showed that they were worshiping God by bowing down before Him. They did. And you might have noticed in your own personal life that there is something about assuming the position of bowing before God, of getting down on your face or down on your knees when you pray to God that is humbling and which in some ways 
may cause you to be more focused on your worship of God. Are you all following what I'm saying? And you may, in that sort of a position, find that your prayer becomes more meaningful. And why is that? Well, because, uh, I, I mean, I could illustrate it. If I asked one of the men of the church to come up here in front of me and bow down, you'd have a hard time doing that, wouldn't you? And, and the reason is this, because it's humiliating. Uh, and if you asked me to bow down before you, I doubt if I would bow down before you. Because why? Well, that's humiliating. But you know, when we are asked to bow down before God, it's humbling. It's us recognizing our place before Him. Now, scripturally, the Bible seems to indicate that it is important for us to bow down before the Lord. I would suggest to you that in your private devotions, you ought to take time as often as possible to bow down before the Lord. Now, if you're driving your car, don't bow down before him. Bow down in your heart, okay? And talk to the Lord while you're driving. Keep your eyes open, too. Do you know? Amen. Listen. Amen. Listen to me. When we pray, we say and we teach, you got to close your eyes. You will not find that in the Bible. But we don't say much about bowing down. And you will find that in the Bible. Isn't that ironic? It's very interesting. All right, again, I'm not going off the rails here. But in your personal walk, in your devotions, you ought to try to bow down before the Lord. Spend some time on your face before the Lord. Sometimes I feel as if I can't get low enough before this great God who is so worthy of my praise. He is so worthy of my worship. And, and you know, as you take time in your prayer to really think about who God is and to call to mind His character and His attributes and His names, and you bow before Him, you might find that it'll have a dramatic impact on your view of God. He is a God that we ought to bow down before. But then the second thing that I want to mention, and I'm not going to propose a solution at this point, but the, the question I want to ask for you is, as a church, when is it that we bow down before God in our public worship? When we as a church family get on our knees and on our face before God and praise Him for who He is. And I've emphasized along the way that we sing in worship and we give in worship and we serve in worship and many of us are trying to live in worship. But I haven't found the place where as a church we are bowing in worship before God. And I, I realize that on Wednesday evening we have prayer meeting and many of us choose to bow down. And I understand that some people physically are not able to bow down. I realize that. And I understand that this is a very unusual thing to think about because most of us have never been to a Baptist church where people got down on their knees and worshiped God. But I'm putting it out there to you tonight to say that I'm really thinking about it and I'm really considering what we ought to do. And I think that there's something to be said for, and one of the biggest objections that I've heard to this is, what will people think who come in as guests and what will they do? Well, I'm not sure what they would think if they saw... God's people get down on our faces before Him and worship Him and praise Him as He is worthy of being worshiped and praised. And so you say, what's the solution? I'm not sure yet. I'm still working on that. Uh, we'll talk about that down the road. We're not going to do anything dramatic or quickly. But I do think that God wants us to bow down and worship Him. At the very least, He wants us to bow down in our hearts. And I think there's something to be said for bowing down before him. You know, oftentimes at the end of the service, we have an opportunity to respond to the preaching. And, and we ask you to respond. And, and if you feel so led of the Lord to come and kneel down, there's nothing special about coming to this, the front of the auditorium. But you might find that it does something for you when you publicly respond and come and kneel down before God and say to him, you know, Lord, that message was right on. That's exactly what I needed. Now, I know it's out of style in our, in our generation. It's less and less uh, 
something that people want to do, they're embarrassed to do, that sort of a thing. But you know, it might do your heart some good if once in a while you got down to the altar and knelt down before the Lord and said, you're worthy of my worship and praise. God, you're worthy of me worshiping you with my life. And so I believe we need to worship God by bowing down before Him. You study it out for yourself and see how often the Bible talks about worshiping. I, I'm going to challenge you with that. You know, the, the moment I started noticing this, I saw it everywhere. Everywhere. I was talking with one of our men after the Sunday evening service. You remember the story about Abraham's servant who was sent to find a wife for Isaac? Do you remember what he did when he found out that his prayer was answered? He fell down on his face and worshiped God right there in the presence of Laban and all of Rebekah's family. He didn't care what they thought or what they said. He was there to serve the Lord, and he got down on his face and started worshiping God right there in their presence. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. That's incredible. You'll see it all through the Bible. All right, quickly, the perversion of worship, and we're done. You know, our worship is something that Satan wants to mess up. Because worship is what God wants the most from us, Satan wants to steal it from us. Satan wants to keep us from worshiping God. He wants to give us the wrong focus. He wants us to come to church. And when we're in the assembly of the saints and we ought to be worshiping God, he wants us distracted by other things. He wants us to go through the motions of outward worship while on the inside we're not paying any attention at all or we're even in rebellion against God. The book of Jeremiah chapter 13 and verse number 10 speaks about this. When God said about the children of Israel, this evil people which refuse to hear my words, which walk in the imagination of their heart and walk after other gods to serve them and to worship them shall even be as this girdle, which is good for nothing. And he's saying, look, these people are claiming to be worshipers of God, but they've lost their glory. They've lost the reality of walking with God and worshiping God. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15, verses 8 and 9, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. You know, Satan wants us to get all hung up on arguing about things and discussing things. Instead of really worshiping God, he wants us to be uh, going around and trying to fix everybody else's life. But what God has called us to do is to be worshipers of him. And, And we ought to be careful that we are worshiping God. Satan wants to distract us. Sometimes he'll distract us with good things, seemingly good things, And those things will draw us away from worship. But I think one of the biggest problems with worship and the way that Satan perverts our worship is referenced in John 4, 24, when Jesus said, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You know, when we worship God, we need to make sure that we have the right heart. That's what the spirit refers to. We need to make sure that we're full of the spirit of God. We need to make sure that we have the right motivation, that we're there for God and not for somebody else, that we're there Uh, with a thankful heart and a grateful heart, not with a selfish and complaining heart. In spirit, we need to worship Him, but we also need to worship God in truth. You see, God is also interested in the form or the format of our worship. He's not just going to accept anything that is called worship because somebody slapped worship on it. I made a mention to you on Wednesday night, much of what is called worship music I have a hard time believing that God accepts that as worship. Uh, It doesn't sound to me like something that would be pleasing to the Lord. What God is interested in is something that is according to what He says is truth. And we need to make sure that our worship is according to truth. Now, I've been teaching about worship these two nights, and I want to say this, that as we think about bowing down before God in worship, that is truth. That is truth. Over and over and over again in our Bibles, God tells us that we ought to bow down before Him. We ought to worship Him in the position that we take in our worship. We ought to show God that we value Him and that we are humbled before Him. It truly is important that we worship. It is important why we worship, and it is important how we worship. And may God help us to become worshipers of God in spirit and in truth. Father, we thank you for this time together. I trust it's been an encouragement and a challenge to our church family. And I pray that you would help us to have wisdom, to see the way ahead, how we can better worship you
and better show to the world around us that we value you above all else. Father, would you meet with us during our prayer time tonight and be glorified as we bring these requests before you? Would you help us, Lord, to be filled with the Spirit of God and to encourage and fellowship with one another? We pray and ask all these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.